So I'm going to talk to you today about a, the MSIDS model, which I think many of you know about, the 16-point model, but I'm going to give you an update on the science of what's been going on in the last couple of years. And there's really some very exciting literature that's come out uh, to help some of you who've not been able to get better. So the title of the talk, Why Can't We Get Better from Symptoms to Solutions, is going to talk today about some of the underlying causes of why people stay ill. And I'm going to do this talk in a little bit of a different way than I usually do. I'm going to talk to you about the common underlying denominators, the things that keep people sick, um, in a way that I think it'll make sense to you when you look at the 16-point model. Um, so the first point on here is that Lyme is the number one spreading vector-borne epidemic in the US and Europe. Now, the CDC told us several years ago that there was a tenfold increase and that it went from 30,000 to 300,000 cases, but I will point out to you that we have three and a half million chronic fatigue patients in the United States. We have one and a half fibromyalgia patients. And for those of you who've looked at those diseases, you'll know that they're also a clinical diagnosis. There is no test uh, particularly for these diseases. And most of the patients who've come to me with these diagnoses end up having Lyme. The other reason it's important to understand that is, is that with these other Borrelia species, like Borrelia miyamotoi that Tom was telling you about, they discovered it in 4% of the people in New England and up to 10% of the people had uh, been exposed at some point, meaning there's probably a much larger percentage of people that have been exposed to Borrelia species than we suspected. Just this past August, the CDC then came out and said, well, actually, there's been a 320% increase in the last 20 years. It's spreading geographically in all directions. It's the same problem in Europe. Um, when I was with China, with the Chinese government, when they invited me over several years ago, uh, they told me privately that 6% of the Chinese population had Lyme disease. Um, that's 6% of 1.4 billion people. That's at least 300 million people in China. Interestingly enough, one of the new co-infections they found a year or two ago called Anaplasma capra was exactly 6% of the Chinese population. Um, so many people are getting sick with Lyme and co-infections and it's really being underdiagnosed. So these tick-borne co-infections are rapidly rising. I'm going to talk to you about this just a little bit to follow up. And the reason it's important is because there's over 100 strains of Lyme in the United States. There's over 300 strains in the world. And for most of the labs, like LabCorp and Quest, are using the B31 strain. So it's impossible to find all these Borrelia species just using one strain. So we've got over 100 different Borrelia species in the US, over 100 different Babesia pyroplasms right now that are showing up. There's 17 or 18 pathogenic Bartonella species, and most of the regular labs were doing Bartonella hensley, Bartonella quintana, Bartonella bacilliformis. We can't pick up most of these Bartonella species. If you look at mycoplasma, which causes autoimmune manifestations and inflammation, there's loads of different species we can't pick up. So one of the key points here is, is that I think one of the reasons a lot of people are staying sick is not just from the Lyme but the co-infections, as Tom talked to you about, but I think it's actually way worse than most people realize. And I'll talk to you a little bit um, more later on about the Alzheimer's epidemic. And my next two books are going to really focus on autism, are going to focus on Alzheimer's, I'm going to focus on a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases, and I'm going to show you in the last three or four years the amazing amount of science that has come out basically showing us that there are a lot of infections and a lot of toxins that are getting into people's bodies, and I'll show you some of the literature today on that. Um, the modes of transmission you heard earlier, it can be in the blood. Um, we know now that Babesia and Anaplasma and Borrelia miyamotoi can be transmitted. There is maternal fetal transmission. Fortunately, I've treated over 100 women um, who've given birth. In fact, just this past week, one woman who's been trying to get pregnant for several years, she just gave birth to a healthy baby girl, and she sent me the pictures over the internet, so that was great. Um, and the sexual piece I'm going to show you a little bit on the literature, it's, it is a really, it's a good unanswered question, um, simply because at this point we don't have really the ability, we haven't done the animal models yet to really be able to prove it. In order to define Lyme, I think really the problem we face is when people say, I have Lyme disease, the problem is, what are we really talking about? The patients, when I talk about it, and the reason I say Lyme MSIDS, Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome, is no one comes into my office at this point who just has Lyme. In fact, as I'll show you in the DAPSOM paper later, 
Um, over 50% of the people come in with babesiosis. It's actually quite higher. This was just a sampling of 100 people when we did the study. Um, and the parasites are playing a big role. And it's not just Babesia parasites that are getting in. Babesia suppresses your immune system from getting rid of other parasites. So we find intestinal parasites that are persisting. Steve Fry in Arizona has been fighting Protomyxo rheumatica, FL 1953, which is eight genetically different parasites in biofilms. And then we have filariasis. We have ticks that are now transmitting worm-like organisms. And we don't know at this point whether some of the people that are staying ill that respond to these anti-parasitic treatments, whether maybe they've got multiple parasitic infections. And I think you're going to see in the years to come that is actually going to be one of the reasons some of you in the audience may not have gotten better. The problems with serology is evident. The ELISA, as I'll show you quickly, and Bob talked about it this morning, it's about a coin flip. Um, we really need better testing. There are labs now in the US, like TGen out in Arizona. They're not just looking at regular PCRs, polymerase chain reactions with DNA. They're actually trying to do more of a fish, of trying to amplify it using RNA. And I think, hopefully, some of that will be uh, very helpful. And then in treating Lyme, you know, is there persistence? Yes, there is. I mean, there's not even a doubt about it. But what I'm going to show you today is the studies coming out of Johns Hopkins University on bacterial persisters and Kim Lewis's lab and how I took this information and did the first clinical study using some of this new research to show how maybe we can get some of these people better that have failed every other treatment course. We know Lyme is the great imitator. It's imitating chronic fatigue and fibro. The reason it imitates these autoimmune manifestations is because some people have what's called molecular mimicry. When your immune system tries attacking the tail of the bacteria, there are some people that goes after the myelin sheath that surrounds your nerves, and that's why you get demyelination. So how many people in the audience are complaining of tingling, numbness, burning sensations, or stabbing sensations? Raise your hands. Yeah, that would fit. It's at least half of the audience. Um, I find probably it's about up to 70% as some form of Lyme neuropathy. And what the bugs do is they stay in the intracellular compartment where the antibodies can't necessarily get in, and they secrete blebs, little pieces of DNA, and they overstimulate the immune system. The other point about autoimmune that's important, I'm going to highlight this also in the next two books, and I'll show you some of this today. They're now showing that a lot of these environmental toxins that are getting into people are causing autoimmune manifestations. So we now know that there are problems with plastics and BPA, that are causing autoimmune problems, as best as there's a lot that is coming out of the literature on autoimmunity and environmental toxins, not just mercury, which causes up to 800 different autoimmune manifestations when you look at it um, in the literature. So what I'll speak to you about today is how the MSITS model, this model of 16 different factors you need to track to get people better, why you really need to look at this and what the common denominator is. And the one common denominator I'm going to focus on today is going to be inflammation. I'm going to show you how, when you look at the MSITS model, how a lot of the different factors on the model are actually driving these inflammatory molecules called cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and also chemokines. These are molecules that attract the cells to the site of the infection and cause inflammation. And I'll show you some of the research that's come out of John Hopkins, which is very promising for early Lyme when the antibodies aren't made, that we get these chemokines called CXCL9, CXCL10, CCL19. These are chemokines, these molecules, that are now found in early infection before antibodies are made. CCL19 is also found in late Lyme because we've been looking for markers how can you tell if somebody's still ill? That's the kind of stuff that John Alcott and some of the Hopkins researchers are now looking at. So it's like someone goes into a doctor's office with 16 nails in the foot saying, I have foot pain. And if you don't pull all the nails, people are not going to get better. And I'll show you the biggest nails that you've got to pull out today because I know it's a, it's a good book to read. Um, but there are actually some simplified ways to understand the model, and you'll see it really makes a lot of sense. The National Science Foundation has told us that the reason we're seeing a lot of these new diseases, these pandemic outbreaks, um, is because of environmental changes, because of global warming. Uh, the World Health Organization has definitely identified this. They're expecting five new diseases every year, and the big ones they're looking at now is Ebola, West Nile, dengue, and, and Lyme disease. 
and of course Zika virus everybody knows about um, at this point, which will be spreading probably in the future. But when we look at the, the WH report, they're now finding all of these different bacteria in the ticks. We're finding Babesia and Protomyxoa. When I was in China, they told me they got rid of filariasis, but that's the worm-like organisms, filarial organisms, that Eva Shapi is now finding in the ticks in both Ixodes and Amboloma americanum in the Lone Star ticks. And that's the question, is whether some of these other parasites are getting in, and as I'll show you, I think from the Dapsone study, the beauty about this study, is this drug I'm about to show you, which has been around for 100 years, to treat acne, to treat toxoplasmosis, to treat dermatitis or pediformis, it treats leprosy. Leprosy is a persister bacteria. Leprosy is a slow-growing intracellular bacteria that's difficult to kill. Lyme is a slow-growing intracellular bacteria difficult to kill. Dapsone not only hits bacteria, it's anti-parasitic. They use it when you want to go to India and you don't want to get malaria, they give you Dapsone. So I'm going to show you some really interesting research on using this drug in combination. Tom talked to you about two drug combinations for Bartonella. I'm going to show you the research that sometimes it's three drug combinations and rarely even four. But these combinations have turned out to actually be incredibly effective in patients that even in my practice, where the MSITS model might work in 90 to 92%, the 8% of the people that I have been struggling with for years to get better, about two-thirds to 70% are responding to this drug. This is very exciting research, and I'm now asked for grants from the Lyme organizations to do a prospective study with John Hopkins or a major university so I can now prove to everyone what I've now been seeing in my clinic for the last year. We have about 400 people. In fact, my wife is finishing up, going into her 10th month, it is the best she has done in the last 20 years. So now I can't get away with anything because her brain is too clear. <laughs> Sorry, honey. So these co-infections that they were talking about is getting much worse. The deer tick virus in our area in the Hudson Valley was one to 2% a few years ago. Now it's five to 6%. That's not good news. Within 15 minutes of a tick bite, this virus can get in and can cause an encephalitis and death in 10 to 15% of the cases, up to 60% in some of them. Equine encephalitis virus, it's up to 10% in ticks in Vermont. The dogs in Lyme disease, when I went to Vermont to testify before their Congress, we found out, Holly Ahern got me these figures, that 16% of the dogs in Vermont have Lyme disease. Well, that's not really great news because the CDC, by definition, says if animals in a state more than 5% have Lyme disease, you're looking at an emerging epidemic. So I told the senators and congressmen in Vermont that if they have 675,000 people and 16% have Lyme, that would be $1 billion out of their $5 billion healthcare budget for one disease. And that's not actually unlikely if you think about it, if you look at Vermont and you look at the topography. Anaplasma rates doubled in Vermont a couple of years ago, and Borrelia miyamotoi, 4% of the people in New England got it, and they didn't even know they had it. The New England Journal reported this just recently. We then did a study a couple of years ago on relapsing fever, but not Borrelia miyamotoi relapsing fever, but Borrelia hermsi. We found up to 28% of the people coming through our clinics, and over 200 people, had evidence of Borrelia hermsi. Now, it could be a cross-reactivity with Borrelia burgdorferi, but the reason I don't think it is is because if you look at the study that Tom Moorcroft did with Dr. Lee, they found also a ratio of three to one of Borrelia spirochetes, of Borrelia burgdorferi, to Borrelia miyamotoi. I'm finding the exact same thing with Borrelia hermsi. It's about a three to one ratio of these relapsing fever spirochetes that are getting into people. And the reason this is problematic is when you have biofilms in your body, and I'll show you the research on that's from Eva Shapi, what happens with the bacteria under the biofilms is they have sex and they exchange genetic material. So relapsing fever by nature, like Lyme, change their outer surface proteins so your immune system can't recognize it. So now you've got relapsing fever bacteria mixing with Borrelia burgdorferi exchanging genetic material. This is gonna be problematic for the population. <coughs> For parasites, I was the first doctor to diagnose Babesia in the Hudson Valley in 1999. A young woman came into my office in a wheelchair. 
She had been sick for five to six years, had received six years of antibiotics for Lyme, could not walk. I took a history. She said, I have drenching sweats. I have day sweats. I have night sweats. I have chills. I have flushing. I have air hunger. What is the infection? Babesia. So this was the first time I'd ever used Mepron and Zithromax. And 10 days later, she was walking out of a wheelchair. I went to my HMO and I said, in my health department, I said, I've got really exciting news for you. I found something in the Hudson Valley that is in the ticks and nobody believed it. And it took several years later. Well, now Rick Osfeld, just two years ago, so when we did the first study, and I did this with Rick Osfeld, thanks to Jill Auerbach, who's here. Jill got us over a dinner to get together, and we convinced Rick to give us some ticks and send it to Igenix in California and to Rhode Island, and they proved there was a small percentage of Babesia in the ticks. 16 years later, in Millbrook, New York, it's over 40%. So Babesia went from a couple of percent to over 40%. And he's now showed that 75 to 80 percent of the time, when Borrelia burgdorferi is transmitted, so is Babesia. So first take-home message for all of you, one of the biggest co-infections that is keeping people sick are these parasites. Babesiosis, without a doubt, is the most common one that I'm finding. I find a lot of mycoplasma. Bartonella I can't tell because I can't do galaxy labs in New York. But you have to look very carefully and do a clinical history to see if people have Babesia. It's the same thing in Europe. Two years ago, they did a study in France. They found four Babesia species, Babesia divergens, which causes a hemolytic anemia where the red blood cells burst apart. We don't see that so much in the States with Babesia microti uh, and Duncani, EU1. And then they found Babesia microti, Babesia major, and Thylaria. These last two species, Babesia major and Thylaria, had never been found there in France. The same thing in Spain. They just found out that about 85% of the ticks in Spain are now infected with these same Babesia species. And now we're finding worms, filariasis. So the Lone Star tick, Amboloma americanum, recently was shown to harbor these filarial nematodes, these worms. So in the study, um, Eva Shapi took Ixodes scapularis ticks from Connecticut, looked at them and found that between 20 and 30% had these worms. Now, is it transmitted or not? We don't know. It's not the filariasis you learn in med school where people get elephantiasis and edema of the lower extremities, although I did have a young girl recently who had that. But is it possible that some of these parasitic infections that are responding to parasitic drugs like Dapsone, like Mepron, like Ivermectin, some of the Lyme patients will tell you that some of the drugs you use for intestinal parasites, like biltricide, ivermectin, alinea, albendazole, they all of a sudden get tremendously better from treating parasites. As I told you earlier, Babesia suppresses your immune system from clearing other parasites from the body. So if filarial organisms are getting in and Babesia is transmitted over 80% of the time, you can't just worry about spirochetes, you've got to worry about these parasites, and I think that's part of the results I'm getting from the Dapsone, as I'll show you shortly. This just came out just about six weeks ago. Co-infections are the rule. In Europe, they looked at the ticks, 45% were co-infected with five different organisms. Now take a look at the numbers here. They found seven different Lyme spirochetes, one relapsing fever, five anaplasma, three ehrlichia, four spotted fever rickettsia, a new bacteria they discovered in Europe in the last several years called Candidatus neoerlichia micarensis. I'd like you all to repeat that three times fast. <laughs> One Bartonella species, 10 species of Babesia, and two Thylaria. Thylaria is like Babesia. They added them up. There were 36 different pathogens in the ticks. One tick bite up to 36 different pathogens. Your doctor's not checking for all these pathogens. No one is at this point. We don't have the technology. That's why we need much, much better DNA testing to find out why people are staying so ill. But the one thing that may work is the majority of these organisms, as I'll show you, they're intracellular. So if you can find a protocol that hits these intracellular infections like tularemia, like brucella, where you need several antibiotics simultaneously, you might find that some of these organisms that are hiding inside the cells, maybe there's a way to get them using one or two standard antibiotic protocols. 
while hitting biofilms, while hitting the cystic forms, while hitting cell wall forms of Borrelia, in other words, working on the biology of what we know about this spirochete and how it persists in the body. The incidence of Lyme disease is rising. We know that from Hook et al., from this is a CDC a couple of years ago, that 1.3% of people in the US in 2009 said they had Lyme disease. Well, that's over 3 million people. So if 10% in 2011 said they personally know someone with Lyme, the epidemic is much worse than what people are suspecting at this point. And the reason this for me is going to be quite important, and I'm going to show you just one of the studies today, the rest of them I'm putting in the books, and you'll see a lot of this, is with the Alzheimer's epidemic, there is now clear evidence. It's been coming out truthfully for years from Judith McClossey um, coming out of Switzerland. Alan McDonald's has been doing work from the NIH where seven out of 10 people in the DNA data bank ended up having Borrelia spirochetes. But what I'll show you is the common denominator. It's not just spirochetes causing Alzheimer's. I'll show you the literature showing that if you have multiple infections, Helicobacter pylori and Lyme disease share one of the same characteristics. They're both spiral organisms, okay? They're both known that they can cause, helicobacter can cause a B-cell lymphoma in the gut. It's known to cause carcinogenic changes. They're now linking this up with Bartonella and Lyme also with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in certain cases. So chlamydia pneumonia and helicobacter pylori and Lyme disease and viruses like CMV, cytomegalovirus, and certain herpes viruses have now been found that the more infections you have, the more the inflammatory response in the brain, the more amyloid production you have, and possibly the worse of a chance. But it's not just that. I'm going to show you on the MSIDS model. Remember, it's inflammation that's driving most chronic disease. So if you think about what environmental toxins are doing and infections, they're driving the inflammatory response. And here we have an Alzheimer's epidemic. The New York Times just reported one week ago, if you saw it on the front page of the Sunday Times, every 67 seconds, someone is being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the United States. That's concerning. That's extremely concerning, just like Lyme is concerning that it gets into women and it's passed on. And yet, no one has come up with a plausible hypothesis of what this is all about. Let me show you how you apply the MSIDS map and how this might actually make sense. So we've got all these new species of Borrelia coming out, getting into people without adequate testing. There are 15 new species in the last 20 years. Almost one Borrelia species per year that is being discovered. So Tom was talking earlier about star eye. Actually, they recently discovered that Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu was found in people with star eye in the Midwest. They used to call it Borrelia um, lone star eye. They didn't really know what it was. So sensu latu species have not been strict. Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu is the one we're normally talking about with Lyme. But they weren't checking for these other species. So these other Lyme-like illnesses are caused by other species. We just never had a proper test to be able to find it. Borrelia bisetti, which they found in California, has now been the latest one that they're implicating apart from Borrelia miyamotoi. And it is in the blood supply. It's been there for Babesia, for Anaplasma, for Bartonella. And Peter Krauss started publishing that Borrelia miyamotoi can be transmitted. Now, the reason this is also important is because in California, there is more Borrelia miyamotoi in the ticks than there is Borrelia burgdorferi. And with the mother tick, it's called transovarial transmission. Normally, Lyme disease, the mother tick cannot transmit it directly to the eggs and to the larva, to the nymphs. With Borrelia miyamotoi, it's been shown that between 6 to 73% of the time, the mother tick transmits this organism into the eggs, into the larvae. Meaning you walk through the woods, you get a couple of hundred or thousand larvae on you, and there's a small chance you could actually get this relapsing fever spirochete, which looks exactly like Lyme. It causes EM rashes, it causes Bell's palsy, it causes encephalitis, and we don't even have good antibody testing for it. The antibody testing is not reliable. It's, it's going to be spreading probably faster than Lyme. So that's why you have to know about these spirochetes and the clinical manifestations of what's going on. We know that also you can transmit Lyme disease and Bartonella, as well as relapsing fever Borrelia to the fetus. Certain spirochetal and Rocky Mountain spotted fever we have to be careful with. 
And Ray Stricker had done this with marine middle vein that they were finding the same Lyme spirochetes in both the sperm and in the vaginal secretions. But again, the problem is, is it likely? Now, the reason I don't think it's likely, and there was a very good um, back and forth discussion that went on with Sam Danta and Ray Stricker at the last LDA conference in Rhode Island. Sam Danta was making a point, he's an infectious disease doctor from Boston. Um, he's one of the fathers of, of Lyme disease. Um, that if you look at the epidemiological evidence of the peaks of Lyme disease, you'll see that it's still from the spring to the fall. You don't see that same peak in the wintertime. I'm assuming people are still having relationships during the wintertime, right? So you'd expect somehow to probably see more. The other thing is from the point of view of infectious diseases, to get strep, you need high amounts of strep in your throat to be able to transmit it. It's not one or two streptococcus that stands a chance of transmitting. What they found in these studies is very small amounts of spirochetes. So is it possible? Yes. Does it happen often? Probably not, but I'm sure it does happen from time to time. We just don't really know at this point in time. The problem with the Lyme and co-infections is especially early on, it looks like the flu. Now tomorrow, for those of you who are still going to be around, You'll hear the story of Joseph Ohlone, who was a young 17-year-old black male just in his prime, was going to Rhode Island. He was going to go help the world with environmental medicine. He came back from Rhode Island with a flu-like illness, went to the doctor with a sore throat, with diarrhea, and said, I think you have a virus. He was still sick. He came back several days later to the doctor, who did a Lyme test, which was negative. Sent him home. He died three weeks later. He had Lyme disease that spread throughout his body and caused Lyme carditis. Tomorrow, here at Binghamton, Jeremy, who helped write the show with Mary Stewart Masterson, who you may know from Fried Green Tomatoes um, and from Betty and June, she and her husband helped to produce this show. They interviewed the family. There's going to be a theater production tomorrow at BU on this. Um, I will be doing the talk back with the audience with them on the stage tomorrow. But this is what can happen in early Lyme with a flu-like illness. Doctors have to be aware it looks like the flu. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, Ehrlichia anaplasma causes the same symptoms. So do many of these tick-borne infections. So does Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So the problem is these are all the great imitators. You have to be very careful when it looks like a virus and it's at this time of the year. So the classic bullseye rash is actually a very small percentage of people. Much more often, you get these solid rashes, right? Solid spreading rashes. The people come in and say, my doctor said it was a spider bite, or I have a cellulitis, right? An infection in the skin. You have to be careful, because if it spreads this way, it can still be Lyme. The way that you know that you need to be more aggressive in treatment is if you have an EM rash, and you've got any of the following symptoms, neck stiffness, headache, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, memory concentration problems. That means the organism got up into your central nervous system. And Pat Coyle from Stony Brook has shown within 24 hours this can happen. If you get tingling, numbness, burning during an EM rash, that means it got into your peripheral nervous system. 30 days of doxycycline or ceftin, cefuroxymaxotil, will not cure that type of a presentation. It means it's disseminated throughout the body. Same thing if you have multiple EM rashes. It's disseminated. You need to be treating these people until they are completely well. You can't stop after 30 days. And then you've heard the studies that the diagnostic testing is not reliable. If you look at the studies, the ELISA test sensitivity is anywhere from 20 to 97%. And it's because we have all these different species of Borrelia that we just can't pick up on a standard ELISA or Western blot. In fact, John Hopkins found it missed up to 55% of those early Lyme cases. Ray Stricker showed it's a coin flip, about 56%. So we know that really, as a clinician, you've got to take a good clinical history and know whether somebody might have it. So how might you know if you have it? Well, if you've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue or fibro, that's already a clue, especially if you have good and bad days where the symptoms are coming and going. But the autoimmune diseases are extremely common. The reason you need to suspect it is because Lyme frequently causes autoimmune manifestations. A large number of my patients have positive anti-nuclear antibodies, but that doesn't mean you have lupus. The way to know if someone has lupus is there's a specific marker called the double-stranded DNA that's 95% sensitive and specific for lupus. You can also get rheumatoid factors that look like rheumatoid arthritis. 
But rheumatoid arthritis is bilateral symmetric. You don't get joint pain that moves all over your body. And there's a marker for rheumatoid arthritis called CCP, cyclic citrullated peptides, very specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So if you have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue symptoms with a positive anti-nuclear antibody or a positive rheumatoid factor, be careful because it may just be that you have an overstimulated immune system from Lyme. You'll often see antithyroid antibodies, antithyroid globulin <laughs> antibodies very frequently, antithyroid peroxidase, anti-gangliocyte antibodies. These are the antibodies against the nerves. This is what you see often in people with POTS dysautonomia where it's affected the nervous system where you can't hold your blood pressure, you can't stand up because your blood pressure bottoms out. And then you get all of these neurological and psychiatric symptoms. One of my patients, this is a great Dapsone story. One of my patients was normal until 18 years old. I just got a call from the infectious disease doctor in the hospital just recently. This kid had been well up until 18 years old. The parents guarantee me he was normal. At 18, he got a tick bite and he became schizophrenic. He came down with psychosis. He'd been to multiple psychiatrists. Nothing was helping him. Abilify, all of these drugs. He got treated for Lyme but did not get benefit. In the years that I've been treating him, the only thing that would make this kid better was anti-parasitic drugs. So I give him coarctum, which is a drug to treat malarial organisms like Babesia, and for a day or two, the kid would wake up, he'd start speaking normally, eating normally, and then he'd relapse. I said to the mother recently, why don't we try the Dapsone? Now this kid is what I affectionately refer to in the practice as my Herx kings and my Herx queens. You know who you are out there. You Herx with even the mention of a drug. You don't even need to take it. This kid was a Herx king. So we gave him a very low dose of Dapsone, 25 milligrams every other day. This is very low. The dose of Dapsone goes up to 100 milligrams once a day. The kid started Herxing. He took one dose, two do second dose the third day, the fifth day the third dose. The parents had to stop it on the seventh day. The Herxes were so severe. He stopped the drug, and all of a sudden, the parents hear him in the bathroom brushing his teeth, and he comes downstairs, and he says, Mom, I'm hungry. I want to eat. This kid hasn't spoken in years. He all of a sudden wakes up and starts eating. He's not spitting. His cognitive functioning improves. But we had to take him off the drug because of the Herxes, and slowly started to relapse. So we put him back on it with a Herx. He ended up in the hospital, and the infectious disease doctor I spoke to, who was open-minded, she was great, she said, what do you want me to do? I said, I can't control these Herxes at home. Give them 100 milligrams of Dapsone. Give them the full dose. They controlled it in the hospital. The kid's waking up. This drug is doing something different. This drug is doing something different, and I have worked with these antibiotics, and I've worked with every herb. I'm going to show you at the end. This is going to be really interesting. Eva Shapi and I are going to be doing a study. It should be done by later this year. We got a grant for it. We're going to take all these different antibiotic combinations with Dapsone and see which is the most effective in culture for killing Borrelia and then look at the prospective studies to kind of see what we've got going on here. Co-infections increase neurological symptoms. If you have bad neurological symptoms, you look at Babesia, you look at Bartonella, you look at these co-infections because they're much, much worse because they drive the inflammatory response. Again, I'm going to be showing you how these inflammatory molecules are driven by co-infections. They're driven by eating the wrong foods. They're driven by leaky gut. They're driven by not getting to sleep, by having mineral deficiencies like zinc. Many different things will drive the inflammatory response. And it's these same molecules, these inflammatory molecules, that give you your fatigue, your joint pain, your memory problems, your mood disorders, your sleep problems. It's all because of these same inflammatory molecules. If you take Alzheimer's patients and you give them a drug to lower tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is one of these cytokines produced in Lyme, their brains wake up and their memory gets better. They've done the studies on this. Dr. Tobrinick did it. He showed that you can start to reverse memory by lowering these inflammatory cytokines. Same thing with the autistic kids. In the autistic population, they found the same inflammatory cytokines being produced in autism. And if you speak to the autism docs, they'll tell you the same thing. There are multiple causes of what they're finding causing autism. Autoimmune manifestations, leaky gut, candida, food allergies, sensitivities to foods, infections, the same things we're seeing 
in Lyme disease, common denominators of infections and toxins driving inflammation. Anyone who has ever had a resistant pain syndrome, you have to think Lyme because it will cause neurological problems like migraines that don't get better. Anyone who's had a neuropathy, that burning sensation that has failed Cymbalta and failed Lyrica and failed Elevil and failed Gabapentum and all of these drugs, Neurontin, you probably have Lyme and Bartonella and other things driving inflammation. I had a patient come to me from the Midwest who was on 480 milligrams of morphine sulfate for pain. Still wasn't controlled. The minute the Lyme and the Bartonella was killed, he was off his narcotics. I had a young girl from the South who recently came to me. The mother contacted me on Facebook. She's in a wheelchair. She's seizing constantly. With nausea and vomiting, she can't eat. The girl is dying. She's seen four infectious disease doctors, four neurologists. The mother contacts me and says, my daughter is dying. You must see me. I mean, I knew Jewish guilt growing up, but this is guilt. Like, if I don't treat your daughter, she's going to die. Great. They fly her out in a wheelchair. The girl is in a wheelchair, and she's, you know, she's conscious, able to answer questions. And I see on the 38-item question, I see drenching night sweats. She's 15. Okay, what's her first diagnosis? Okay. I examine her skin. She has stretch marks all over her body. Diagnosis? Great. I say with your joint pain, it's horrific. Yes, I'm on also 400 milligrams of morphine. I say, does the joint pain migrate around your body? Migratory joint pain is the hallmark of Lyme disease. You guys are good. You could have you could have beat those four neurologists and four infectious disease doctors. And the fourth diagnosis, the fourth nail in the foot, is I tried standing her up. Her pulse weight went up 40 beats per minute. She bottomed out her blood pressure. What did she have? POTS. This woman on a clinical exam without a blood test had Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, and POTS. She went out of the office on doxycycline and rifampin to treat the Lyme and the Bartonella. Malarone and Artemisia to treat the Babesia, and Fludrocortisone Florineth with salt and fluids. She comes back one month later, she's walking out of the wheelchair, she's no longer seizing, she's off all her medications, and she's going to parties with her friends. That is a clinical diagnosis. That is what medicine was supposed to be about years ago. You have got to pull the history out of people to be able to do this. That's where I'm going to show you using the questionnaire of how this works. So you would suspect if someone has Lyme, if they have good and bad days, but here's really the key point. And we're going to publish this study. The study should be published. For those of you who are on my Facebook page and filled out the questionnaire from SUNY New Paltz, thank you, because we have all the responses. We've gotten up to 1,600 people with Lyme non-Lyme to do some great statistical analysis because no one has ever had a validated symptom questionnaire that has been statistically proven to work. We now have researchers from SUNY New Paltz who's been working with me. What we found out is this migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, migratory nerve pain, highly sensitive marker for Lyme disease compared to a lot of these other diseases like chronic fatigue and fibro. If you're a woman and you're worse around your period, very common with Lyme. When the estradiol drops off, that's when women will get worse. If you took an antibiotic and you didn't know you had Lyme for a urinary tract infection or an upper respiratory infection, and you said, I'm better or worse, worse being a Herx, right? That would indicate you might have an infection with Lyme. And pain that's resistant to standard treatment modalities. You keep going to these pain doctors and they can't give you enough medicine and your pain is not controlled. You have to think Lyme in these co-infections. So it's a multi-systemic disorder. I took Dr. Boriscano's questionnaire, and what we did is I weighted the questionnaire based on mild, moderate, severe, and frequency. We used the CDC Healthy Days modules. We took a look at factors that would give you the risk of Lyme, like do you live in a Lyme endemic area, and we came up with a score. Now, the data we had from last year, or the year before, from 2014, and about 600 people, is that a score more than 46 was more than two standard deviations above the mean and that it basically validated with convergent, divergent, and predictive validity. I'm not a very good statistician, that's why I hire a PhD statistician to work with me, but what this means is it's a pretty good screening tool. 
So in the middle of a worldwide epidemic where we don't have adequate testing, this questionnaire is at least a good screening tool. This can be used in pediatricians' offices, in psychiatrists' offices, where people come in with depression, anxiety, or psychosis. If you have a multi-systemic problem, you have to look and make sure Lyme is not there. The key points is it's multi-systemic. You look at the blood tests. The reason we're using the C6 ELISA, which in the years prior, by the way, I never even did an ELISA. The test was so bad. The interesting thing about the C6, when Jill also invited us over to her home, I think it was a year and a half ago, and Ben Beard was there from the CDC, Ken Liedner and I met with him, we were discussing a little bit that the reason the C6 was better was because it's picking up some of the European strains of Borrelia, like Borrelia afzeli, which causes a rash, ACA, um, or Borrelia garinii that causes neuroborreliosis. It's picking up other strains. And I have patients, definitely, who are C6 positive, ELISA negative, or vice versa, and sometimes Western blot positive. So the C6 is not, I won't say a great test, but if you're going to do an ELISA at all, it's certainly a reasonable test to see if someone has it. Of course, the problem is with all of these different strains, it's not going to pick up uh, everything, which is why we kind of look at um, when we do the IgenX Western blot. And the reason I use IgenX, um, I have no financial ties with them at all. It's just they are such a great lab because what they did is, it was brilliant, is if you knew you had several strains of Borrelia out there, put the same ones on a Western blot. So by using the 297 and the B31 strain, you see the banding on the Western blot a lot better. So if you have a high score on the MSITS questionnaire, and you've got a 23 band OSPC, or 31, or 34, or 39, or 8393, these are Borrelia specific. Now, it could be Borrelia miyamotoi. It could be Borrelia sensulatu. It could be other Borrelia species. But at least we know you've been exposed to Borreliosis. And that's at least a good clue for the clinician to start with if they're not sure what's going on. And then there's PCRs, but not great in the blood. We definitely need to develop better testing. The lymphocyte transformation test, or the ELI spot, it's not bad for certain people um, to take a look at that test if you have a negative. Culture has been debated at this point. Um, the CDC has not said that Advanced Labs has a good culture. They're, they're challenging the validity, and we're still waiting to see some of the results on that. But this is really some of the best exciting work that's come out in the last couple of years because Lyme disease right now is only curable in the early stages. So when Dr. Soloski and his colleagues at Hopkins discovered that you could find some of these inflammatory molecules, these cytokine signatures, with early stages like these CXCL9, CXCL10, and CCL19, this would mean that before your body makes antibodies to get an ELISA or a C6 or even a Western blot, you can find these in the blood. So they're now looking at this through Columbia, the Spira test. They're checking this out to see how accurate. And Johns Hopkins is also looking through John Alcott to see if we follow CCL19, that may be a reasonable, reliable marker for someone that has chronic Lyme disease, because that's really what we're looking at, is to figure out who's got chronic infection. Unfortunately, my experience is the vast majority of people are chronically infected. Doesn't mean everybody stays sick. But more of my concern, and someone had asked before the question is, do you have to treat it or can't get over it? More of my concern is what I'm about to show you about the Alzheimer's epidemic and some of these other things coming out, that some of these infections and infectious burdens the higher the infectious burden in your body, the more inflammation, the more amyloid that's being produced in the brain. The problems with the testing is not just for Borrelia burgdorferi, but also for Borrelia miyamotoi, um, and other tick-borne diseases, as we talked about earlier, very difficult to be able to pick this up. When we do Babesia testing, we generally will do a titer, an IFA, immunofluorescent antibody, but I use the fish a lot. And for those people who are having the day sweats, the night sweats, the chills, and you're not sure if it's Babesia, the FISH test will pick it up sometimes in about 40% of the cases where the titers or the PCRs um, won't pick it up. But I do a net for all the tick-borne infections, and I can tell you in the last couple of years, the number of people with Coxiella, with Q fever, with tularemia, with brucella, the numbers are rising in the last couple of years. I've been very surprised. In fact, there's another article I'll probably be publishing this summer in Medical Hypothesis. The dapsone that you saw is a persister bacteria for Mycobacterium leprae, but there are other Mycobacterium drugs that I started playing with a little bit, and it's actually helping 
again, some of these people with resistant symptoms. Why the confusion? I think you know these two guidelines exist, although at this point the IDSA guidelines are off the government's website. The only guideline, yes, you can clap for that one. Um, they were nine years old, they should have been taken off years ago. So the ILADS guidelines, the ones that Dan Cameron um, did with Betty Maloney and Lorraine Johnson's fabulous, they used IOM criteria, Institute of Medicine, very high quality guidelines. The problem is though, They'll give you general guidelines of how to treat, but it won't go through the details like the MSIDS model, which is really what you see in clinical practice. So we need to change the criteria. We're missing a lot of people with this. And there's definitely in the literature, I won't spend a lot of time, but the reason it's persisting, it's been shown in the literature, it's in the skin. Now, what's interesting about that study by Klempner, Dr. Klempner was the first doctor who did the first NIH double-blind trial with Lyme. I actually participated in that trial. I picked him up from the airport in Newburgh and drove him to my office. This is when I was using Polaroid cameras to take pictures of EM rashes. So I had him sit in my uh, kitchen with 70 charts with Polaroids of EM rashes. And you know, he's like drooling, oh my god, look at all these great lines. So we were able to enroll some of the patients. Unfortunately, the study, it was ruling out, it was, there were things, there were problems with the study because anybody that had positive PCRs was thrown out of the study. Nobody had co-infections in that study, which is impossible because everybody has co-infections, which is explaining in part why they're ill just about. Um, but he also found that the fibroblasts of the skin, if you put Borrelia in a skin, right, in a fibroblast, in a vat of Rocephin for 14 days and you pull it out, the Borrelia is still alive. 14 days in a test tube with Rocephin. The fibroblasts are protecting it. It can go deep in the tissues in the eye, in the ligaments where you don't have a lot of blood flow, deep in the joints, in the endothelial cells and macrophages. Now, when you see the studies I'm about to show you of where I'm getting success, I believe it's actually the intracellular compartment, the endothelial cells and macrophages. These are very, very important in controlling the inflammatory response in the body. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of the responses to these double or triple, or even sometimes quadruple intracellular ribbons making a difference when nothing else worked. Goes up into the central nervous system. Dr. Liegner had a case that the CDC and NIH was following, Vicki Logan. This was a nurse who had Lyme encephalitis. She was on years of antibiotics. The insurance companies denied her. She ended up dying. They did spinal fluid and Analysis of her brain and the spirochetes were alive after years of treatment. Yet, somehow, Lyme doesn't persist. The CDC and the NIH were involved in this particular study. This is political, this is not medical, and I think you all know this, but this is not, unfortunately, just a medical disease. It is highly politicized, and it's problematic because of what I'm going to show you with these other overlaps with some of the neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. Biofilms, we're about to discuss it in a second. Mice, hot sick showed. You gave mice the usual antibiotics. You could find Borrelia up to eight months. But what's interesting, the people who say it's dead DNA that you're finding, right? The problem with that is dead DNA does not transcribe genes. So if genes are transcribing eight months later, that Borrelia is alive. It may not be culturable because antibiotics shift the forms of the bacteria, but it's alive and it's transcribing genes. And even Dr. Marquez from the NIH showed that she could find PCR evidence of people with Lyme in their body after standard treatments. But if you read the conclusion of the article, they did not say that chronic Lyme persists. But again, that was just more the politics of the day. It clearly persists, because if you have a PCR that's positive for hepatitis B or hepatitis C or HIV, you're not gonna say that it's dead DNA you're gonna be treated for these diseases. You can't say one disease, it does work, and the others, it doesn't. Why does Borrelia persist? There's immune evasion. It changes its outer surface proteins, just like the relapsing fever does. So that's part of the reason it persists in the body. And they've now found in the last couple of years, it's in biofilms. Now what's interesting about biofilms, this could explain why we have not had the results that we really wanted over the years of treating people with either herbs or antibiotics. If you look at the NIH, they're estimating that 60% of human infections and 80% of refractory infections are due to biofilms. So these are cells and extracellular polemic substances in a matrix where it's a barrier for the antibiotics and antibodies to get in there and kill the bugs. 
And if we look at what are biofilm infections, well, there's a lot of dental stuff we've talked about today. If you have plaque on your teeth and you have to go to the dentist to get it off, that's a biofilm, right? Now, what's interesting is that last one on here, Porphyromonas gingivalis, they found pieces of Porphyromonas gingivalis in the plaques of Alzheimer's patients. The people that had chronic gingivitis with inflammation in the gums, this bacteria made it up through the blood-brain barrier and they're finding it in plaques. So start to think again now, I'm gonna to start to give you the idea of infectious burden. The more infections in the body, the more inflammation, the more amyloid production, the more fatigue, the more headaches, the more joint pain, the more memory problems. So we've got to get to all of these different biofilms, but we know that Clostridium difficile is a biofilm. So is Salmonellosis. Salmonella is a chronic persistent infection. You can go into your gallbladder after you have it and hide. So is yeast, so is Klebsiella. It's not that we don't know about biofilms, just no one ever associated it with Lyme disease. We know that there are cystic forms, right? So what do you treat cystic forms? Well, there's Plaquenil, right? There's grapefruit seed extract published by uh, Dr. Borson. And then I was the first doctor to do a study on flagell. This goes back to like, I think 1998 or 99. I did the first study on flagell showing it was a factor for Lyme. And six months later, Dr. Borson from Norway showed that it actually kills cystic forms, as does thinidazole. So we have to get these cystic forms because they transform into mobile spirochetes. It's a way for the organism to go dormant, like persister cells that I'm about to show you, so that it has a way of avoiding where you can kill off most of the bacteria, but some will survive and be able to come out later on. Is there a treatment that shows that if you have disseminated Lyme, longer treatment gets you better? Well, yes, there are four studies that have been done. In fact, the last one by Oxy, they found Borrelia by PCR and by culture, and culture is the gold standard. So we do find it, that it persists. We do find that longer treatment is helpful. When we look at the study that was done by Alison DeLong a couple of years ago, and she looked at these double-blind placebo-controlled studies by the NIH, she actually found that two out of three of those studies, people did get better. In the Krupp study, their fatigue got better, and in the Fallon study published in neurology, their encephalopathy got better. It showed that Rosefin was working on PET scans, and we could see that there were differences in the brain, but it didn't hold. The people didn't stay better. Why didn't they stay better? Well, I find because they have 16 overlapping factors keeping them ill, and as I'm about to show you with the work on persister bacteria, we've got some real new clues as far as how we may be able to treat people and get them better. When we went to medical school, we learned there was one cause for one disease. What I'm coming up with now after being in medicine for about 30 years is that that is no longer true. This MSIDS model takes into account that there are multiple overlapping factors driving the inflammatory response in people's bodies. So you have Lyme, but you have other bacteria like mycoplasma species that cause inflammation, like chlamydia pneumonia that causes inflammation has been found in multiple sclerosis like viral infections, Epstein-Barr virus was just found to reactivate in people with MS. We know that if you have cytomegalovirus with rheumatoid arthritis, your symptoms are much worse. And then we find all these parasites that we were describing. And then we've got immune dysfunction. You've got an overstimulated immune system with autoimmune phenomenon from the Lyme. And then you've got inflammatory molecule cytokines being produced. With all of these environmental toxins getting in, Three to 500 environmental chemicals are getting into your body every day. The majority of them are carcinogenic. So if you look at the cancer epidemic, where you look at 40% of the American population in prevalence at some point has been exposed, you're starting to look at, well, why are all these people getting cancer? Is it possible that their immune system is somehow being suppressed and they can't handle the normal cancer cells that are being produced in the body? A lot of these toxins getting in act as foreign-based estrogens. They're called xenoestrogens. So PCBs, plastics, bisphenol A, heavy metals like mercury, a lot of these things act as foreign-based estrogens. They've been shown to cause breast cancer, colon cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, uterine cancer. So why do we want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables with broccoli? Because certain of these estrogens are bad for the body. 
You move the estrogens eating cruciferous vegetables. You get them down the right pathways. You open up the detox pathways, as Tom talked about, to get this stuff out of the body. Doctors, when you go in for prevention to a medical doctor, they talk to you about mammographies and colonoscopies and PSAs, but nobody talks to you about, let's check how high your toxic load is, and let's see how your liver is working to be able to get rid of these toxins. You'll see this coming out in the next couple of years, just as you'll see work on the microbiome of the gut. With all the exciting new research of what's happening by changing the bacteria in your gut and stopping an autoimmune reaction, or changing the bacteria in your gut and stopping heart disease, or MS. I'm going to show you some of the literature on this in just a little bit. So here's the MSITS map. We've got bacterial infections, parasitic infections, viruses, candida. We know that they're very common in the ticks. You've heard quite a bit about it today. And co-infections, as we said, are the rule. So the majority of people who see me, they've been exposed to Ehrlichia anaplasma. Many have Bartonella. Mycoplasma we find in the vast majority. Occasionally rickettsial species. And Babesia probably being the number one that I'm finding in most of my patients from the point of view of parasites. And that's what one of the fish uh, studies looks like under the microscope from one of my patients from Igenix. It fluoresces green. So if you've got these fever chills flushing, day sweats or night sweats, and you're not well with Lyme, you've got to be tested and treated for Babesia parasites. It really makes a huge difference in getting people better. And Dr. Uh, Krauss had published years ago, 20 years ago, that people with Lyme and Babesia are three times sicker. What was interesting, again, about what Babesia does to the immune system is they could find the Lyme PCR, the DNA of Lyme, three times more frequently in the blood when people had Babesia. So again, Babesia is suppressing the immune system, not only with other parasites, but it's doing something to people with Lyme disease. And the most important thing you need to do in medicine, which I learned as an internist, which is rule one, is you always do a differential diagnosis. So this is, I think, page 68 of my book. If someone comes in with day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing fevers, I say to myself, well, what are the eight most common things that cause that, right? Are you in menopause? Do you have hyperthyroidism, right? Do you have a problem with tuberculosis that you have drenching night sweats and a cough? Or maybe you've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Look at a chest x-ray. Or maybe you have brucella. Brucellosis can cause drenching sweats. But the most common, without a doubt, is babesiosis in my patient population. And we will check the different Babesia species, but unfortunately, as I said, there's over 100 pyroplasms. So you may not be able to find all these Babesia species just looking with one test. And then the second point, immune dysfunction, very common. Inflammation, we see it all the time. People are getting all these toxins. But the fifth point, allergies, you might be surprised how much food allergies are playing a role in keeping all of you ill. They just published one week ago that the Mediterranean diet, okay, makes a huge difference in longevity with people, as does the paleo, that people are doing better with paleo and Mediterranean diets. And what we're finding in people is if you haven't been tested for food allergies, and not just IgE, but IgG, they will drive the same inflammatory molecules in your body that Lyme does. So people who are sensitive to foods, if they eat the wrong foods, they're going to get the same interleukins and the same cytokines produced that make the Lyme symptoms worse. It will make your joint pain worse, your fatigue worse, your headaches worse. Foods play a huge role. I have patients off gluten and off even all grains who will tell me they feel much, much better. Even if their markers for gluten sensitivity, anti-gliadin and TTG, even if they're negative. So if you're still sick and you've not gotten tested for food allergies, and you haven't done a trial off all grains, not just gluten, you should get off it and actually see what is happening. Part of this, part of this problem may be with wheat is there's a lot of Roundup. I don't know if you've seen this in the literature, but Roundup is now showing up in a lot of these grains. So there may also be a problem with people who are sensitive to a lot of these pesticides um, that are getting to people at this point. There are problems with nutritional enzyme deficiencies. With all of these chemicals getting in, if you have problems where you don't have your biochemical pathways can't get rid of it, and they start accumulating, and you now get a herx from Lyme and you have to detox these toxins and you're loaded with toxins, your system can only take so much at once. And that's why detoxification, getting rid of the toxins, is just as important as it is for some people. I had a doctor recently visit with me 
who thought that she needed IVIG for an autoimmune encephalitis. She said, my Lyme has not gotten better. And I said, have you ever tried glutathione? You saw this from Tom. And I gave her a shot of glutathione, and within 15, 20 minutes, her brain completely cleared. And it was like, oh, toxins. Toxins and infections are playing a huge role here. When you get all this free radical oxidative stress, these infections and toxins cause inflammation by driving free radicals. What happens with oxidative stress, inflammation, is that it hurts the mitochondria, the part of your body that you need for the heart function, for energy, for neurological function. So it's not a question of just treating infections. You need to heal the body. You need to get the mitochondria back in order, and in about a third of the people, they will notice that they get help with helping the mitochondria. There's psychological issues, a lot of neurological dysfunction. When you get this inflammation, it shuts off the pituitary, the master gland in your brain, and all of a sudden men at 20 years old have no testosterone, or women don't have periods, or the thyroid is off, they get Hashimoto's, or the adrenals, 40% of my patients have low adrenals. You need adrenals to fight infections. If your adrenals are low, you can take all the herbs and antibiotics you want for Lyme, you're not going to improve in the same manner. So the hormones need to be balanced. Without balancing the hormones, very difficult to get some of these people better. And then the sleep disorders. Lyme patients don't fall asleep and they keep waking up in the middle of the night, right? You all know this quite well. Well, the thing about this is, with this common denominator of inflammation, one of these inflammatory molecules called interleukin-6, IL-6, is secreted in large quantity when you can't sleep. So not only is the Lyme causing inflammation and causing you not to sleep, but sleep causes more inflammation. It becomes a vicious cycle. You're eating the wrong foods. You don't have the right minerals. You're not falling asleep. Multiple things driving inflammation in the body. And then this inflammation affects the part of your body that helps you to keep a normal blood pressure. So when you stand up, you drop your blood pressure, and you're tired, and you get palpitations, and you get dizzy, and you feel like you're going to pass out, or some do pass out, or you get anxiety attacks. And it's all from Potts dysautonomia, because you have to heal the part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. If your blood pressure is low, you're not going to perfuse your brain. That is not a problem if I didn't use enough rocephin to cure Lyme. It's a matter of bringing up your blood pressure, just like this woman in the wheelchair we talked about from the South who got tremendously better once the POTS was treated. None of the doctors had ever looked into POTS as one of the nails in the foot causing her to be sick. The 13th, GI disorders. Many people I see have leaky gut. Antibiotics, if you take them too long and you don't properly give the right probiotics, you can get candida in the gut. It causes inflammation, it leads to food allergies, and you get leaky gut. Leaky gut will cause elevated levels of histamine. So you know about the Claritin study that came out where they said that there's this enzyme in the bacteria which is a manganese-based enzyme, and you give Claritin and you cure Lyme disease. So I ask my patients if they're Claritin clear when they come to see me if they happen to be on it. Well, I spoke to Dr. J from Stanford just this past weekend. That was at the Bay Area Lyme Foundation Gala. And we sat down and he said, you know, I think some of it's from histamine. Well, the thing I see with histamine all the time is that when you eat the wrong foods, how many people here in the audience notice they start to itch after eating or they start to get congested or they notice they get mucus or they get asthmatic attacks and they can't explain why? That is from histamine release. Well, histamine also drives inflammation. So part of the problem may be histamine with all the other inflammatory cytokines causing a problem. You can get liver elevations from cytokines. Lyme causes liver elevations, so does Ehrlichia, so does Anaplasma, so does Q fever with a chronic hepatitis, so does rickettsial infections. How does it cause liver function elevations? Inflammation, inflammatory cytokines. Why do you get pain syndromes? Inflammatory cytokines. There is one common denominator in all of the points on the MSITS map, and that is basically you have got to get to all the underlying sources of inflammation. These next two slides is the essence of this talk. You've got to get all the infections, Lyme, mycoplasma. You've got to hit the parasites like Babesia. You've got to get that immune system balanced. Some people do need IVIG. We use Plaquenil for most of our people. You've got to heal the mitochondria. 
But the gut, if you have the wrong bacteria in the gut, they've shown that, for example, certain lactobacilli cause inflammation and certain bifidobacterium decrease inflammation. Guaranteed in the next 10 to 20 years, what you're going to see is your doctors be giving you a pill or maybe through other mechanisms will be giving you strains of probiotics to change the microbiome of your gut and help you to deal with your gluten sensitivity. There are rothia bacteria you can introduce that stops gluten sensitivity. They've shown that Clostridium species have been associated with MS, Prevotella species associated with rheumatoid arthritis. This is one of the frontiers of medicine I'll show you at the end, that if you have the wrong microbiome in your gut, it's causing inflammation. This may be one of the big clues, bigger than I think most people have suspected, for getting people better, is just by taking massive amounts of the right probiotics. Then you've got the leaky gut and food allergies and the sleep, all these chemicals getting in. Now, mold, we're finding black mold exposure in about two-thirds of our patient with resistant symptoms. They're positive for aflatoxins, for okra toxins, for trichothicines, and a new toxin just showed up five months ago from real-time lab called gliotoxins. Why are gliotoxins important? They're immunosuppressive. Do you want immunosuppressive toxins in your body when you're fighting all these infections or trying to get over cancer? I'm finding gliotoxins in a large percentage of people who are ill who don't get over this illness. I don't know the role yet. We're detoxing them, we're pulling out the mold. I don't know the role, but I can tell you this, you never want to give a Lyme patient high doses of prednisone if you can avoid it and basically take down their immune response because a lot of them will crash. There are Babesia patients who have died from having taken steroids. So you can't immunosuppress someone with multiple infections. Just like if you have a rheumatoid patient who goes on Enbrel or some of these drugs that are TNF-alpha inhibitors, they suppress your immunity, they tell them, be careful, you might get lymphoma. You might get a reactivation of tuberculosis because it's suppressing your immunity. We're finding mold toxins which have an immunosuppressive effect. Is it a clue? We're gonna find out in the next couple of years. Nutritional deficiencies. Zinc. If you have low levels of zinc, the NIH has done scientific studies showing you have more inflammation. They showed in nursing homes and people that were the sickest patients, if they had low levels of zinc and you gave them zinc, they didn't get as sick. All of a sudden, they got much better. We find the endocrine disorders and then again, POTS disorder on it. So if you look at the double-blind placebo-controlled studies online, none of these had ever accounted for all these overlapping sources of inflammation. So the common denominator that we're finding in all these parts of the MSITS map is inflammation. Infections and toxins are increasing inflammation. They're causing these autoimmune reactions to happen in the body. And it's through these pathways that drive cytokines, interleukin-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, the nitric oxide pathway. All of these things are causing inflammation so if you understand pulling the nails out of the foot, it's those eight things I just showed you on the MSIDS map that if you don't drive down the inflammatory process, people are just not going to get better. And you notice at the bottom of the slide, they found exactly the same thing in autism spectrum disorders. By the way, they found the same thing in chronic fatigue patients. They found the same thing in fibromyalgia patients. When I was writing the book, my first book, I went through the medical literature and looked up chronic fatigue, which is now called systemic exertional intolerance disease. <laughs> really? That's the best you could do? The same cytokines show up in chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autism, Alzheimer's, Lyme disease. Think about this. Are they all separate diseases, or is it possible that infections and toxins, as Tom was explaining, are driving the inflammatory response? What about these neurotoxins? Definitely. It's not a question in more antibiotics in some people. It's a question of detoxing them. There is a specific toxin called quinolinic acid that is produced in Lyme patients that when you use glutathione and toxin binders and pull it out, people feel much better. So you, you see the same biological effects. And if we look at the cost of chronic illness in the United States, 
70% of the deaths and 86% of our healthcare costs in the US, which is now 16% of our GDP, is from chronic diseases. And we do not have a common denominator, a common model to address chronic disease. Maybe this is a good place to start. So if you look at Alzheimer's, we find these cells in the brain called microglia. They're small cells in the brain. They're activated by beta amyloid. What do they do? They increase the same inflammatory cytokines you get with Lyme. And they affect the part of your brain called the hippocampus, which deals with memory. Now, I don't know if you saw this come out about a week ago, where they now talked about antihistamines and H2 blockers also affecting histamine and causing cholinergic problems that they may be causing some of this problem also. So there may be multiple factors also affecting the hippocampus of the brain, and we need to look at that in great detail. So in Lyme disease, infections and toxins cause inflammation, right? It's all in the medical literature. Lyme causes inflammation. We're getting all these toxins like quinolinic acid and chloral hydrate, mercury, pesticides, mold, and it's causing inflammation. What about in multiple sclerosis? We know that in the medical literature, Lyme, chlamydia pneumonia, and Epstein-Barr virus have all been published in the medical literature to have a relationship with MS. Mercury and toxins have now been associated with autoimmune manifestation like BPA and asbestos. It's been shown that they cause demyelination and autoimmune diseases. So what we're starting to see is that the environmental toxins are driving some of the autoimmune illness at the same time the infections like the spirochetes are doing exactly the same thing. So while the rheumatologists are saying you have a rheumatoid disease, take an immunosuppressive drug, the problem in medicine right now is no one is getting to the source of the problem. They're labeling a disease and they're throwing pharmaceutical agents at it. And look, I, I love some of these pharmaceutical agents. They're great for certain people, but you've still got to get to the underlying causes of why these people are sick. Inflammation, low vitamin D and MS. What about autism? This was through Dr. Kuhn and Dr. Bransfield, 44 out of 48 children with autism, in, in fact, improved on antibiotics. Toxins, UC California Davis two years ago showed that pesticides are getting into these kids, causing autism, and Harvard in that same year discovered that mercury, lead, manganese, methylene chloride, and diesel fuel was getting into these kids, also causing some of their autistic spectrum disorders, and also causing inflammation. Infections, toxins, driving inflammation. What about Alzheimer's? Look at this study that was just published two years ago. Seven out of 20 patients with dementia had Lyme in their CNS and stabilized with antibiotics. The higher your infectious burden, viruses, CMV, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus one, or bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme disease, chlamydia pneumonia, or H. pylori, the higher your burden, the more your amyloid production with Alzheimer's. The same year, JAMA published that pesticides are being found in people with Alzheimer's disease, raising the risk of Alzheimer's. And then Dr. Tobernick discovered if you lower inflammation, the memory of people with Alzheimer's gets better. Infections and toxins driving inflammation. Is this making sense as a common denominator for many of these different diseases? So the way this is happening on a biochemical level is you get these infections and there are different biochemical pathways causing the inflammation. One is the nitric oxide pathway, which can be good, like if you have heart disease and you take nitroglycerin, you want more nitric oxide. But one of the byproducts of nitric oxide is called peroxynitrite, and it causes the stimulation by a switch inside the nucleus called NF-kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B. This is an important switch to understand. Because the more free radical oxidative stress you have, the more this switch gets turned on inside your nucleus, making these inflammatory molecules. So you have to use either drugs, which are immune modulators, like Plaquenil, or drugs with an anti-inflammatory effect, like macrolides, tetracyclines, or IVIG. Those can be useful. But what can you do from a natural perspective? Well, apart from getting to the cause of the problem, they found that if you use antioxidants, things like CoQ10, B vitamins, alpha lipoic acid, magnesium, zinc, 
Even omega-3 fatty acids, they found even eating fish with mercury lowers your Alzheimer's risk. That's how important the omega-3s and the DHA are as far as decreasing the inflammatory process in people. That was just published, if you hadn't seen it, just a couple of months ago. So NF-kappa B is this switch inside the nucleus. If you have oxidative stress, it turns on all these inflammatory molecules. The way you block it is with glutathione. The way you block it is alpha lipoic acid, which helps your body to make more glutathione and decreases free radicals or other antioxidants. So if we look at all the chronic illness that we're all worried about getting as we get old, and you look for the one common denominator, free radicals oxidative stress has been published in the medical literature to be associated with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, strokes, heart attacks, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, scleroderma, diabetes, cancer, cataracts, asthma, cystic fibrosis, atherosclerosis, every one of these chronic diseases, it's been shown, is related to inflammation published in the medical literature. So we have to be careful with what the inflammatory response is going on in our body. How do we lower inflammation? Here's the last part of the talk. Well, if you've got this switch inside your nucleus that turns on inflammation, called NF-kappa B, how do you stop the switch from turning on? There's a molecule inside your cells in the cytoplasm called NRF2, NRF2. When you have free radical oxidative stress, NRF2 moves into the nucleus and it binds to genes inside your nucleus called antioxidant response element genes, or ARE. And the way you turn this on is with curcumin. Tom talked about this. Turmeric or curcumin translocates NRF2 into the nucleus to shut down the inflammatory response. Green tea extracts have been shown to do the same. So does resveratrol that's in red wine. And so do phytochemicals. So when the American Cancer Society says, eat lots of fruits and vegetables and eat the rainbow, especially with the blueberries and the raspberries and the dark leafy green vegetables, they contain phytochemicals. One of those phytochemicals, which is very powerful, is called sulforaphane glucosinolate, broccoli seed extract. I personally take 200 milligrams a day of this because my entire family died of cancer. My mother, my father, and six aunts and uncles, I have no living family members, a couple of cousins, but all of them have died of cancer. And they lived in Brooklyn early on. Tom, you also have patients from Brooklyn, right, who are some interesting stuff going on in Brooklyn. My parents were all exposed to toxins. They were all smokers. So is it genetic? Is it smoking? Is it toxins? I don't know. I'm not taking a chance. I'm basically looking to take things like sulforaphane because in the autistic population at Harvard, when they gave the autistic kids 300 milligrams of sulforaphane broccoli seed extract, two-thirds of them, their autistic spectrum disorder symptoms got better by shutting down the inflammation and opening up the detox. Now, your liver has several pathways to get rid of these toxins. It's called phase one and phase two. Sulforaphane broccoli seed extract is the strongest inducer of your phase two enzymes to detoxify your body. This is something, in my opinion, that most people on the planet should probably be taking because of the toxins that you want to lower inflammation. You can also block activation, I told you, with Alzheimer's and in Lyme disease, these small cells in your brain called microglial cells activate and cause inflammation. Tom mentioned low-dose naltrexone. LDN is very good at blocking NF-kappa B, the switch in the nucleus, and signaling these toll-like receptors to tell your immune system to start pulling back and shifting response from antibodies called Th2 to Th1. You need a Th1 response. This is the ones like your natural killer cells that go after viruses and cancers. That's what you'll get from using things like LDN. You can do an anti-inflammatory diet. Very important for people to try a Mediterranean diet, but to be off grains even in some people or try a paleo for some people, and push the omega-3s because sometimes too much omega-6s causes too much arachidonic acid causing inflammation, which is a type of an inflammatory prostaglandin. It's another inflammatory molecule. There are good prostaglandins, there are bad ones. You've got to replace the minerals. I said to you that if you don't have enough zinc, you get inflammation. 25% of my patients, the first time they see me, are mineral deficient. 
because when you're eating a healthy diet, with even if you're trying to do the American Cancer Society 9 to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables, which no one could probably do in their lifetime if they tried, I'm finding that most people are deficient in zinc, needed for inflammation, copper, needed in an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. If you don't have this enzyme, you can't handle the oxidative stress and your cells get damaged. Or magnesium, which is needed in 300 enzymes to detoxify these chemicals. You've got to get checked not by serum magnesium, serum copper, serum zinc, but red blood cell. You've got to ask your doctor if he's not done this test. You need an RBC zinc, an RBC copper, and an RBC magnesium because 99% of these minerals are inside your red cells. And I just had a young woman with a seizure disorder who came from a very far distance away. They could not control her seizures. And in this country, I'm not gonna mention where she come from, but they could not test red blood cell magnesium. She was completely deficient in magnesium with a seizure disorder. That is about the worst thing you can imagine in a young kid because magnesium is necessary to balance out the brain chemistry. You need to get proper sleep and exercise because it's gonna drive inflammation. You've gotta treat the infections because it's causing the inflammation and immune dysfunction. You've gotta detoxify and get these chemicals out of your body, which also cause inflammation. You've gotta balance the hormones, balance the cytokines, and balance the microbiome. Get the good bacteria, the anti-inflammatory ones, into the gut, heal the damage to the body caused by the free radicals, heal the mitochondria, and heal the damage to the mind and emotions. And this is really quite important. Tom talked about this a bit at the end. The role of love and compassion. Many of these people who've been sick for a long time, they've lost their jobs, they've lost self-confidence. Many are what I call the walking wounded. They've had tremendous trauma um, early on in life from multiple sources. If you have had trauma and you're still suffering from it, your immune system will not fight the infections correctly. This I can tell you for sure from having helped people with this. All of these 10 points, these are the points that all deal with inflammation on the MSIDS map that help people to get better. So this is just the details. If you move the NRF2 to these genes, it enhances detoxification, it lowers inflammation, and it inhibits cancer growth. Who here does not want to have lower inflammation and enhance or inhibit cancer growth in the body? That's what sulforaphane does. That's what green tea does. That's what resveratrol does, that's what's curcumin. So when I tell Lyme patients and they ask about supplements, I use these specific supplements quite a bit in the Lyme community because they have been scientifically proven to move NRF2 into the nucleus and to take down the inflammatory response. And again, for those of us who have very strong cancer histories, they're also epigenetic modifiers. They tell your DNA, which was normally gonna be programmed to go in a certain direction, to stay on the straight and narrow. That's what methylation does. That's why methyl B12 can sometimes also be so helpful. So broccoli seed extract, when you look at what this does, not just for autistic kids, it, it helps your phase two liver to work better. It's an antioxidant. It's anti-inflammatory. It actually hits helicobacter in the stomach and inhibits tumors. It's a wonderful product to be able to use. What about resveratrol from red wine? they've shown that there are genes in your body called the sirtuin genes that influence age-related diseases like cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, and neurodegeneration like ALS. So you want resveratrol basically telling your genes, right, working on that to make sure from an epigenetic perspective that the DNA stays on the straight and narrow. And it has great anti-inflammatory properties antioxidant, and again moves NRF2, NRF2, into the nucleus to shut off NF-kappa B. Curcumin shuts down almost every inflammatory molecule that you can imagine, but you have to sometimes use high fat to get high levels into the blood. It again translocates NRF2 into the nucleus to activate these genes. And what just came out on what's new is they've discovered in fish oils in these omega-3 fatty acids, that there are molecules called SPMs. So they've discovered that inflammation happens in two stages, in initiation and in resolution. And resolution is an active process that takes place by these things called SPMs. And they're different from the standard fish oils that you and I would normally take. 
There are three different types of SPMs that they've discovered. They're called meracins, resolvins, and protectins. It's now been published in the literature in the last couple of years. And these interact with the macrophages, which try and eat up the bacteria that are causing the inflammation, and they increase an anti-inflammatory cytokines. I've been telling you that there are all these inflammatory cytokines causing inflammation, but there are also cytokines that are anti-inflammatory. One of them called interleukin-10 is anti-inflammatory. That's what these SPMs also help to do. They also lower some of the inflammatory prostaglandins. So we just started a study in our medical office looking at some of the people with the worst inflammation using high doses of these SPMs to see if we'd shut off the inflammatory response where it's not worked with other products. And then there's LDN, as we talked about, published in Crohn's disease, published in fibromyalgia, published in multiple sclerosis, and I've now at this point done it over a thousand people with Lyme. Very, very useful. But if you have a sleep disorder, in about 20% of the people it causes problems with insomnia, you may have to take it first thing in the morning. So how else do we decrease it? Give LDN, two milligrams for one month, three milligrams for the next month, 4.5. Immune dysregulation with autoimmunity. I said earlier that there are these pieces of DNA secreted from the Borrelia inside your cells that cause an overstimulated immune system. That's how you get the positive anti-nuclear antibodies, the positive rheumatoid factors, the positive anti-gangliosides. So you've got to be able to find a way, again, to get these inflammatory molecules down. One of the ways, as I've said, and I've now stressed this several times, is please get tested and find out what your sensitive foods are. I have a lot of food allergies. I have asthma and allergies. If I avoid my allergic foods, like dairy, coconut, dark chocolate. Thank you, thank you. Can I get a little more of that, please? Uh, thank you, thank you. My wife is eating the dark chocolate and I'm, uh, I'm itchy richy after I'm eating that thing. The way you know, by the way, if you have a lot of histamine, everybody pull up their sleeve. I want you to write the letter R with your fingernail on your forearm, okay? Write the letter R on your forearm. The first person who sees it come up, and you can see the letter R, raise your hand. I want to see the raised hands one by one as you see the letter R start to come up on your arm. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, this is called dermatographism. What is dermatographism? There are cells in your skin which are basophils, mast cells, and what they do is they release histamine. So the way that you can tell, an easy way if you're a histamine releaser, is if you mark a nail and it starts coming up with a wheel reaction quickly, that means you're releasing histamine, okay? So if you itch or sneeze or wheeze or have mucus congestion after a meal, or notice foods seem to make you very tired and you start yawning and you have reactions, it could be that you have these allergic sensitive foods. They've been shown to be a problem in chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. They've been linked up to people who have chemical sensitivity. So you really do need to check this. Unfortunately, in New York, we can't do the subfractions of the IgG. We can only do IgE, which is okay, but it's really not enough for a lot of these people. And again, if you find it, you need to look at leaky gut and candida, because it will make a big difference in some of these people that have a lot of allergic manifestations. Now, one of the things that also is interesting is some people, after a tick bite, will get what's called an alpha-gal allergy. So these are people that they eat dinner, and they have some meat or some pork or some lamb, and they're in the emergency room four hours later with an anaphylactic reaction because they got bitten by a Lone Star tick, and they got allergic to something inside that the tick gave them, and they get what's called an alpha-gal allergy. If you ever have an unexplained anaphylactic reaction, you need to get checked for alpha-gal allergies through your allergist. There is a way to check this on IgEs in the blood. Um, I have not yet found it. We've been looking for it, but that is something you should know if anyone has a severe unexplained anaphylactic reaction. So in these people, you need to do a lot of rotation diets, treat the gut, treat the candida, and a lot of people will get better. We talked about replacing the minerals, how important that was. Look at the deficiencies in our diet. This is basically coming from the US population, Department of Agriculture, back about uh, seven years ago. They found that a lot of people 
were deficient in multiple nutrients. Now, when they're talking about not meeting the recommended daily allowance, they're not talking about getting three to 500 chemicals in your body and having to detoxify them with minerals and proper fruits and vegetables. They're just talking about what most people need, like for women, folic acid to not have a neural tube defect for your child. You need much more to be able to deal with all these environmental toxins getting in. Then as we said, you've got to get to sleep because it's associated with all of this inflammation. Again, a report in the literature making rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia much worse. But the thing about sleep, and I'm going to be at the IFM conference next week talking about this. I'm doing a 90-minute presentation on sleep, and there are 26 different things that I discovered that affect sleep. Okay, So the most common ones we see, besides Lyme and co-infections, is obstructive sleep apnea. Interestingly enough, we have thin women in our practice that we never would have suspected that you may need to get a sleep study for someone who keeps having problems with sleep. We find some restless leg. We find some people on medications like Vyvanse that doctors give them to keep them awake. Very long half-life interferes with sleep. They may be doing caffeine later on in the day. Um, they may be having problems with their prostate, getting up in the middle of the night to urinate. There may be depression. The point is, is when I looked in the literature, there are up to 26 different reasons why people don't sleep. You really need to go through a differential and get to sleep to shut down the inflammatory response. And we find that sometimes giving um, what I'll call atypical sleep agents, one that get your body into stage three, stage four non-REM sleep, this is before the dream state, like Lyrica, Pregabalin, Trazodone, Gabitril, Seroquel, Zyrem. These are atypical drugs that we learn about in med school, but they're not really classic sleep drugs. Sometimes they do a very good job if your usual drugs like Ambien, Monesta, and the rest is not working. And then we find that for some people using simply 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, GABA, L-theanine can be very useful, high-dose valerian, um, melatonin, um, there's one by neuroscience called Cavanase. Um, there are many different natural products. We combine these for people to get them to sleep. How do we treat the infections? Borrelia has cell wall forms. It has cystic forms. It goes inside the cells. It has biofilms. So how do we treat? We attack all of the different forms because we know the biology of the organism. It can change forms. So we will use cell wall drugs like penicillins or cephalosporins. We'll use cyst busters like plaquenil or grapefruit seed extract, occasionally flagyl. We'll treat with intracellular drugs like tetracyclines, macrolides, rifampin, quinolones. I'm going to speak to you in just a bit about dapsone and pyrazinamide, which is a TB drug. And I'll talk to you about biofilms, serpeptase, stevia, which Dr. Shapi found attack not just biofilms, but many different forms of Lyme. In the study I'm about to show you on Dapsone, what we did, and I think the reason we had some of the success, is we treated all the different forms with the biofilms, with the cystic forms. We pulsed the cephalosporins, AKA Kim Lewis's work that I'm about to show you, to try and hit the bugs. And we found that when we used persister drugs like Dapsone, we definitely got some help. So Tom was talking earlier about using at least two intracellulars. Well, one of the most common ones that works is probably doxyrifampin. Now, over the years, I've used a lot of doxyrifampin, or I've used doxyrifampin and Zithromax, or doxyrifampin and quinolones. Does it work? Yes. But does it cure people? No. Now, do I know that Dapsone cures people? Absolutely not. But what's interesting is, in some of these people who had previously been on doxyrifampin or zithrorifampin or any of these combos, when I added Dapsone to some of these double intracellular combos, or even three drugs, and I'll show you how I did this, some of these people who had been my worst Lyme patients for the last 30 years, about two-thirds, almost up to 70%, are noticing improvement. In fact, just last week, for the first time, two people finished the full 12 months of the protocol. Why 12 months? Because when I stopped Dapsone at two months initially, people relapsed. When I stopped it at four months, people relapsed. When I stopped it at six months, people relapsed. Why did I choose a year? How do they treat leprosy? It's a persister bacteria. It's slow growing, intracellular, difficult to kill. They use rifampin, common drug we use for Lyme and Bartonella with Dapsone. Rifampin in Dapsone is a persister regimen for a persister bacteria. 
So I said, as a starting point, wouldn't it be interesting to just take a similar regimen used for mycobacterium infections and see if it works in Lyme, especially because Dapsone has anti-parasitic effects. And I told you about all the Babesia and the worms and the FL1953 protomyxoa and intestinal parasites showing up in people where the parasites play a large role. So we have to start looking at these bacterial persisters and persister drugs because they found in the last two years that these persisters are a small fraction of bacterial cells that survive the antibiotics you normally take for Lyme, but once you stop the antibiotics, they regrow. And they found the same thing for TB, for syphilis, for endocarditis, where they have to use long-term antibiotics, and for biofilm infections. And what Dr. Zhang from Hopkins did is in culture he said, well, if I use daptomycin, which is the brand name is Cubicin, the only time we've used this drug is for people who have an endocarditis who have failed vancomycin. I never used this drug before in my life. I've now used it four times. I tried exactly what Dr. Zhang said to do. I gave people daptomycin by body weight. I gave them a cephalosporin. It was not cephaloparazone. One of the patients was recephin. Other ones were ceftin, which he published was still good. You could still use it. And I gave them a tetracycline. And I tried it. Most of the people herxed like crazy on this protocol. One of the patients two weeks ago who stopped it, his brain woke up after he stopped the protocol. In other words, there might have been some benefit to using that persister drug, but it's $10,000 for one month of daptomycin. So do you really think the insurance companies are going to approve a drug? It's not going to happen. So the reason I did the Dapsone trial is because Dapsone is cheap, it's generic, the drug's been out for 100 years. Now, there's side effects that I'm about to show you. You have to be very careful with this drug. You should not all be running out of here going, I want Dapsone. Let me show you the side effects before you run out and do this. So you know, but for people who have failed every protocol, and again, I've been treating my wife now for 20 years. She's been sick for a long time. It is without a doubt one of the best drugs, including for brain function. I am able to avoid IV drugs and IV recephin in some people. I'm going to show you the statistical research we did in it. It gets into the CNS, and some people's cognitive improvement is miraculous when we use this drug. Now, if we look at, where am I here? I feel like I'm going two different directions here. There we are. OK. There was a trial that was just done in Europe called the PLEASE trial. It was the same exact thing they tried to do for the NIH years ago. They didn't give biofilm busters. They didn't use cis busters. Borrelia forms persister cells. There were no persister drugs. So we know that there's reasons why people did not improve. Previously, when people got better, and I still do this, we would use a lot of these herbal protocols, whether it's the Zhang protocol with herbs or whether it might be Byron White or Cowden. And by the way, these work. They'll work in about 70% of the people. Eva Shapi, I did initial work using cementobanderol. She found that it killed off Borrelia in the test tube in about 70%. It does work. There's not even a question that you should be on some of these things if you don't have eutrexis from it. The problem is, is of course, they're still not curative. But they do work for people in all of these different symptoms. And as we talked about, if you detox people, big, big improvement. I had a study I presented at the uh, 16th International Lyme Conference back 13 years ago, where seven out of eight patients who failed every antibiotic, if all I did was detox them with high dose glutathione up to 2,000 milligrams, their fatigue was better, their joint pain was better, their muscle pain was better, their cognitive function was better. Why? Because glutathione lowers inflammation. The same common denominator, and it pulls toxins at the same point. And you've got to get quinolinic acid out of your body. We're finding all these mold toxins, as I said, being found in people. We're finding very high levels of heavy metals, mercury. Mercury causes neuropathy. Mercury causes fatigue. Mercury causes brain problems. You don't want mercury in your brain causing autoimmune manifestations with Lyme. And we're finding elevated levels of pesticides in our Parkinson's patients. So for example, this is a standard heavy metal test we found in our patients. High mercury, high lead, high cadmium. Why don't you why these, and especially cadmium? Cadmium's been linked up to breast cancer. Cadmium's been linked up to prostate cancer. 
Cadmium pushes zinc off the prostate and drives free radical oxidative stress, driving prostate cancer cells to grow. You don't want these in your body, but the cancer doctors never will generally test you for heavy metals and say, get rid of cadmium. It's an overlapping factor, just like toxins. So when you look at the heavy metals in Lyme, it's all the same symptoms. And about 25% of my patients, when we get the heavy metals out, they get better. They don't keep needing antibiotics. They don't need persister drugs. They just need to get the toxins out. This is a recent patient who came in with Parkinson's disease that we checked her and she was loaded with pesticides. I don't know if you can actually see it on here, but the normal is less than five. She's over a thousand. And she's not the first Parkinson's patient. It's known that pesticides have been associated with Parkinson's disease. When you give glutathione to a Parkinson's patient, they start moving better. David Perlmutter had looked at this actually 15 years ago. And we see this a lot in patients. So you have to always keep in mind these detox principles. Ensure hydration, right? Dilution is the solution to pollution. <laughs> I didn't make that up, that's Sherry Rogers, but it's a great one. <laughs> Increase your antioxidant reserves like alpha lipoic acid, sulforaphane, broccoli seed extract, resveratrol, curcumin, right? All the stuff we talked about that translates, translocates NRF2 to shut down inflammation. Help the liver to biotransform the toxins. Get the mitochondria to function. Keep down the toxins and get the bowel health in order. So you can do far infrared saunas, right? One great way to get the toxins out, we have a far infrared sauna in our basement. You can do colon cleanses, use probiotics and fiber. We've had good results using oral phosphatidylcholine with glutathione with toxin binders. I don't do any IV treatments for mold, and I get it out with oral phosphatidylcholine with glutathione with toxin binders. And nutritional supplementation focusing on the things that we've talked about earlier, and for some people needing methylation cofactors. You gotta get the blood pressure up as we talked about, because you're resistant to fatigue, dizziness, memory concentration problems may be due to low uh, autonomic nervous system function. You've got to get the mitochondria working properly. CoQ10, NADH, acetyl L-carnitine, phospholipids, right? All of this stuff is in my book. How did it go with the Lyme doctor today? Fantastic. He mixed all my meds and supplements into one pill. I really should take a picture of our kitchen and show you what I swallow every morning. It's, it literally would probably fit into something like that. Balance the microbiome as we talked about. Make sure you don't have celiac, you don't have Crohn's, you get rid of the parasites, right? You've got to check for all that. And here's some of the studies on bacteria and health, really fascinating. They looked at lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, different inflammatory profiles. You can take someone with prediabetes or diabetes and transplant the bacteria from someone who's not diabetic and all of a sudden their glucose tolerance completely improves. No more insulin in the future, changing simply the microbiome of your gut. What about rheumatology, neurology, Prevotella species have been shown to increase rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. But if you have bacteroides fragilis, it decreases autoimmune disease. MS and clostridium, they found that clostridium species in the gut may be associated with inflammation with MS. And those who had too much of a species called Firmicutes had a higher cardiovascular risk. Interesting, not just hypertension, not just high cholesterol, not just the things we learn to decrease strokes and heart attacks, but manipulating the microbiome of the gut. And then meditation. JAMA just published this a little while ago. They looked at 47 trials, and mindfulness meditation improved anxiety, depression, and pain. And by the way, it lowers inflammatory cytokines. They've actually shown that meditation lowers the same inflammatory cytokines we've been talking about, Elizabeth Blackburn then also did some studies, and it increases telomerase activity. This is the enzyme that tells your DNA, the caps of your DNA, to lengthen, which has been associated with a longer and healthier life, just from meditating. And now we're at the end. So what's new? Why did I start using this drug? So this is an antibiotic known as diaminodifelsulfone, DDS. It's been used with rifampin and clofazamine for the treatment of leprosy. Now what's interesting about clofazamine, if you go back to the Johns Hopkins studies and you looked at what Dr. Zhang had identified as persister drugs, you're gonna notice clofazamine, 
was actually one of the drugs he identified, which is a leprosy drug. It is a sulfa derivative, and what's interesting about dapsone being a sulfa drug is in the research out of Hopkins, what they identified is sulfa drugs like Septra, which we use for Bartonella and for Lyme and for Babesia, turns out to have certain effect on persisters. Now, I've had really good results using Bactrim over the years, and maybe you just need a year of it, like Dapsone, to get people better. That's a study that could be done that can't tolerate Dapsone. So the previous use is leprosy, toxoplasmosis, malaria prophylaxis, acne. They sell Dapsone preparations. I have patients coming in all the time putting Dapsone cream on their face for acne, and dermatitis herpetiformis. But there are some serious side effects of this drug that I'm going to tell you about, which is why you don't just rush on it, and the doctors have to really be trained in using this drug. I call it do no harm, H-A-R-M. H is for herxes, A is for anemia, R is for rashes, and M is for something called methemoglobinemia. And I'm gonna to explain to you what this is. We have about 400 people right now on Dapsone. We published the first 100 people who are on the drug for about one to four months. And what we found is, is that when we added Dapsone as a third intracellular drug to people who already did double or triples, some of these people had a miraculous response. They also had huge Herxheimer reactions. This drug is a huge Herxheimer drug. It has to really be used carefully, and I'll show you how to do that. It has an effect on resistant Babesia. You heard from Tom, and I didn't go through the slides, I could show you the research by Krauss and others, that Babesia persists. There are four persister bacteria parasites we have to worry about. The three persister bacteria are Lyme, Bartonella, and Mycoplasma. I just had a woman who gave birth to twins. She was on Zithromax during the nine months of the pregnancy with Sefton. Zithromax is supposed to kill mycoplasma. On her amniotic fluid at birth, there was a mycoplasma PCR that was positive. This is not the first time I've seen this. I've had patients come to me from other doctors who've treated for Bartonella for one year with single drug regimens, doxyzithro, Bartonella PCR positive in the blood. So three persister bacteria, Borrelia, Bartonella, mycoplasma. Where do they all go? Intracellular. Keep this in mind. And then we have a persister parasite. Babesia definitely persists. I did studies on it, Krauss's studies. So we have four things we need to think about as persisters. Dapsone has anti-parasitic properties at the same time. So this is the first published study of an oral persister medication. Let's look at what the results were. For those of you who have not taken statistics in a while, a p-value less than 0.05 is considered statistically significant. If you look at the p-value on this side, you'll notice the p-values are less than 0.05 except for headaches. In other words, in the Stapsone study, it statistically improved, statistically significant, fatigue, joint and muscle pain, neuropathy, tingling, numbness, burning, disturbed sleep, memory concentration problems, and day sweats, night sweats, chills, and flushing. It helped almost every symptom we see in chronic Lyme disease except for headaches. So who should take Dapsone for Babesia? Because it helps with the sweats. Well, if you've already been treated with clindamycin and quinine or clindamycin and mepron with Septra, or you've taken mepron and Zithromax with Septra and herbs, so you've taken malarone and coarctum and daraprim and primaquin and alinea and artemisia and cryptolepis and neem, and believe me, folks, I'm one of the Babesia kings. I've been trying to kill this parasite now for 30 years. It is difficult to kill. I will see patients' sweats go down on Dapsone, but it has to be the full dose. This is what's a little difficult. At 100 milligrams of Dapsone with four malarone, with some artemisia and cryptolepis, I had people who failed every protocol for Babesia that the sweats finally went away and they said that they were better. But the problem is getting them to 100 milligrams of Dapsone, and I'm gonna show you basically how we do this. So when we looked at Dapsone before and after for the Babesia symptoms of day sweats, night sweats, and chills, so these are people, for example, who before Dapsone, after, right? So here they had no sweats. So mild sweats actually went up a little bit. But the reason the mild sweats went up is because the moderate sweats went from 30 to 
The severe sweats went from 16 to 5%, and the really severe sweats went to zero. Dapsone is really, really helpful for Babesia, but you've got to get people to tolerate it, okay? Third table. We analyzed in the 100 people who did this Dapsone trial how many were Lyme positive, Babesia positive versus Lyme positive, Babesia negative. Now what's interesting about this, so Lyme positive, Babesia positive means you had a positive GM sustain, positive titer, positive PCR, positive Babesia fish from Igenix. Okay? Anybody who had that with symptoms. What's interesting is if you look at the p-values, the starred ones are significant. The people with Lyme and Babesia who did better with Dapsone, the joint and muscle pain significantly improved if you had Lyme and Babesia. Your sleep got better, your memory concentration got much better, and look at your day sweats night, look at the figure on the, P, on the T value, look at this. It's less than 0.01 when you look at how it did for Babesia symptoms. When you look at how it was Lyme positive, Babesia negative, it still helped the muscle and joint pain, and it still helped the forgetfulness, but actually there was a difference between the two cohorts of whether you tested positive for both species. But this is really important, and I would suggest doctors who want to learn to use this. They come to my practice, they train with me. I've had, at the last eight weeks, I've had seven doctors out of eight weeks train with me, okay? One recent one who came from Spain, who's about to be the most Lyme literate doctor um, in Spain, because they've got a huge epidemic going on in Europe. I'll be doing also a talk at Omega. I have uh, flyers for it, you can see out there. It's a three-day course. I'm going to be talking about this in detail. You need to understand how to use this drug. This drug has significant side effects. Number one, Herx's. It is one of the largest Herxheimer drugs I have ever used in my practice. Now here's the problem I face. The initial study before I knew what I was doing using Dapsone, I started people on the full dose at 100 milligrams. And then people came in four, six weeks later, and I said, how did you do? They said, I had the worst Herx I have ever had. But once I got through the Herx, Doc, it was the best I've been in 13 years. And that's the case study that I published in the report. But the problem is, is we don't know if you have to start with the high dose or you can start with a low dose and work up because some people cannot tolerate the 100 milligrams. What I've had to do, the, the drug has a half-life of about 28 hours. So if you're herxing like crazy, what I've had to do is give the drug, let's say, for 11 days, 11 on, 3 off. 11 on, 3 off to let the drug come down, let the herx subside, and start back on it. That is what has shut off the Herxheimers in some people, apart from using low-dose naltrexone and glutathione and all the tricks that I just showed you earlier. The second thing is anemia. On the average, you're going to get a 2 to 3 gram drop in your hemoglobin using Dapsone. How much folic acid do you need to stop that? Between 30 to 45 milligrams of folic acid. So we have used leucoforin at the pharmacy, 15 milligrams twice a day, that's folinic acid, 30 milligrams, with L-methylfolate, either through a company, nutritional company, or like Deplin. And what we found is between 30 to 45 milligrams of folic acid will keep the anemia between two to three grams. Once you don't take that amount, you're going to drop your hemoglobin to four gram drops, which if you're a woman and you start off at a hemoglobin of 11 because you have an iron deficiency anemia, you do not want to take this drug. I tell women before you do this, you've got to cure your iron deficiency anemia, get your hemoglobin hematocrit all the way up, and call the doctor immediately if you start having heavy periods. You may need to come off this drug and replace your iron because you do not want to get iron deficiency on top of dapsone-induced anemia. However, if you stop the drug and you give high doses of folic acid, like I'm talking five times 150 milligrams, the hemoglobin hematic will grow straight back up to normal, quickly. I've reversed anemia with dapsone within seven to 10 days by stopping the drug, so you will go back to normal. The anemia goes back, the CBC returns to normal. But you have to be very careful in women who start low. The higher your hemoglobin to start, the easier it is to take this drug. The third one is rashes. Now what's interesting about rashes is Dapsone is a sulfur drug, but there are people who can take Batrim or Septra who do not have a side effect of this drug. They can still take it. 
But you have to speak to your doctor carefully because they may need to do a Zyrtec Zantac, a histamine one blocker and a histamine two blocker if you have any sulfur sensitivity and you have to discuss this with your doctor before going on it and you do not start at 100 milligrams of Dapsone. You start at 25 milligrams, the drug comes in 25 milligrams and one hundredths. So you can start 25 every day, one quarter dose, blocking histamine. How are you doing? Then you gradually go up, maybe the next week, 50, 25, 50, 25. How are you? Herxing? No, doc, I'm good. Keep checking the anemia. Do a CBC every three weeks with a biochem and check methemoglobin levels. What is methemoglobin? The hemoglobin that carries your oxygen can get oxidized using Dapsone. It actually happens with other sulfur drugs and other diseases. Oxidized iron from the plus two to plus three state does not carry oxygen well. So if anyone starts complaining of blue hands, blue feet, and blue lips, with difficulty with shortness of breath, fatigue, or headaches, they have to stop the drug immediately, get a methemoglobin level. I've had about four to six cases in 400. It's a little over 1%. How do I stop it from happening? I use massive amounts of glutathione because the way you reverse methemoglobin is as an alternative pathway using glutathione. So by using NAC and acetylcysteine and alpha lipoic acid and liposomal glutathione, you can keep down the oxidative stress which oxidizes the hemoglobin. And so for example, you might get low levels of methemoglobin which is very well uh, tolerated. But you've got to check the methemoglobin regularly I've never had to use methylene blue, which reverses it within one hour. So in an ER, if you had this and you were really short of breath, they can reverse it within an hour with methylene blue. So there are tricks your doctor needs to know. This is not a benign drug. It is not something you rush on. But the good news is I've learned to mitigate the side effects, having now had hundreds of people that have used this drug, between 30 to 45 milligrams of folic acid, using very high doses of antioxidants with glutathione, watching the CBC carefully, making sure women don't get iron deficient. This drug has turned around a whole bunch of people who failed every other drug for treating Lyme disease. But the methemoglobin is probably one of the most severe side effects that you have to watch for. But in all of the cases that it's happened, by simply stopping the drug, it's gone away within 24 hours. So the good news with the anemia, you can reverse it very quickly by stopping the drug and giving high doses of folic acid, just like if someone took too much methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. Same thing with the methemoglobin, and even a trick is Tagamet. It turns out that Tagamet, which is an old H2 blocker, actually helps with methemoglobin also. So these are all the tricks, but this is a drug that is a little bit tricky to use, but can be extremely effective in people who have failed. And the reason I think it's going to ultimately be very useful is because this helps people not to have to go into long-term IV therapy. Because I showed you the cognitive benefits and the benefits with neuropathy and pain and fatigue, this may avoid some people having to put a line in their arm and doing high dose long-term. That's something that needs to be determined. We don't yet know the effective dosage and length of treatment. Several of the patients at 50 milligrams of Dapsone for six months relapsed. One of them was PCR positive. I know for a fact that 50 milligrams for six months is not enough. That's why now my trial of Dapsone is 12 months just like for leprosy. And now we're gonna push all these patients out to 12 months and we're gonna redo the study and hopefully publish it, but we're looking for a prospective study with Hopkins or any university that will do this because now that I know the drug works, now I'll be able to show all the university researchers how this works for people who have failed the other regimens. But we don't know the dose, we don't exactly know the length of time. We don't know if it's going to last. Just last week, for the first time, people were taken off. But one of these patients was six for 15 years, one of my worst patients. It was the best I have ever seen her. She just came in last week. And I said, stop everything. I don't want herbs. I don't want antibiotics. I don't want Plaquenil. I want to know how you're doing off everything. Usually, I've got them on herbs for months and years. I told now the people at 12 months were stopping everything to see how far we went with this drug. We don't know what the combinations are. We know rifampin and dapsone seems to be quite effective, but is zithro rifampin dapsone better than minnow rifampin dapsone? We don't know. That's the study we have to do with Eva Shapi. We use cyst busters like plaquenil grapefruit seed, but is Tindamax maybe more effective? We use biofilm busters, usually stevia serpeptase or stevia lorisidin. 
monolaurin. But we don't know if maybe one biofilm buster or combos is better to get these drugs through the biofilms, which will allow these persister drugs to work better. But the advantage is it avoids IV therapies in some people. They don't have to take Mepron at $750 a bottle. And a lot of people are on long-term Mepron. So the insurance companies at some point may actually end up liking this drug quite a bit once the doctors learn how to use it in a safe and effective manner. And that's what we're continuing the studies on. But people with resistant fatigue, pain, sleep disorders, neuropathy, cognitive problems, babesia, two-thirds, 70%, just roughly. I mean, it's not working for everybody, obviously. But there's a lot of people who are responding to this drug, and it looks very, very promising. So putting it together. Chronic Lyme, or what I'm calling Lyme MSIDS, is the symptom complex of Borrelia and co-infections driving the inflammatory response. But there are 16 reasons why people are staying sick, and the biggest point, the eight on the map, is basically causing inflammation. Some of these have infections causing quinolinic acid and toxins. You have to detox. You've got to get the autoimmune under control. But it's the same reactions we see in chronic fatigue, fibro, autism, Alzheimer's. Same biochemical medicines, one common denominator. 86% of our chronic health care costs are chronic disease. Maybe this is a good starting point for the model. We get people better by treating all the forms of Borrelia with biofilms and co-infections, getting the inflammation down, getting the immune system balanced, pulling the toxins, pulling out the heavy metals and mold, detoxifying people, getting them to sleep, getting them off the allergic foods, getting their autonomic nervous system and blood pressure right, and getting those nutritional deficiencies in order. And then, of course, Dapsone and other novel persister drugs, I think, will be, after having done this for 30 years, this drug is doing something different than any other drug I have ever used before, which is why I'm excited about it. But again, we still don't know the long-term results. We don't know if it's going to hold in people or not. That's what we're about to find out. But is at least new research coming out for those of you who failed that at least gives us hope based on all the great research coming out of Kim Lewis's lab at Northeastern and Zong's lab at Hopkins. So bon voyage, oh, by the way, I can't say when I'll let you off the Lime Hell ride. I'm hoping. <laughs> The Dapsone and the 16-point MSIDs, at least we'll get some people off of this, and parting wise words of health. The Dalai Lama, when asked what surprised him most about humanity, answered, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he's so anxious about the future, he doesn't enjoy the present. The result being, he doesn't live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die, and then dies having never really lived. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention today. It's been a